If you would, you're invited to stand either physically or in spirit for the reading of the gospel. It comes from Mark 12, verses 28 through 34. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them of all the commandments, which one is the most important? The most important one answered Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and that there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. The word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. If you would, please pray with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, <clears throat> protect me from me and hide me behind the cross. May the words that I speak this morning and the thoughts that we together share be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my strength, my Redeemer. Amen. I read last month or so in a, in a Christian magazine this story that was relayed and it was about this successful young executive who had, who had just purchased the car of his dreams. He had just bought this very, very expensive, <clears throat> I think it was a Lexus, but, but the top of the line convertible had everything on it and he had just an hour ago had picked it up from the dealership and, and he was driving it. He had the top down and he was speeding a little bit. And he had the music blaring and, and he was on cloud nine. He was just enjoying life. And he was going through this neighborhood when all of a sudden, bam! A brick hit the side of the passenger door. He screeched on his brakes and you can well imagine how mad he was and he put it in reverse and he went back to this, to this young boy that was kind of standing on the other side of the street and he got out, he slammed his door, he ran over to him, he said, how dare you? What are you thinking? This car, it cost a fortune and you just ruined it. How dare you? What were you thinking? And then he noticed the tears that were streaming down that boy's eyes. And, and, and he kind of stuttered. He said, sir, I'm so sorry, but nobody would stop. I didn't know how to make somebody stop. But you see, my brother, I, I'm, he's in a wheelchair. I was pushing him and, 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 and he fell out of the wheelchair and, and I can't, he's too heavy. I can't get him up. I need help. Somewhat chagrined, trying to swallow that rapidly swelling lump that was in his throat. He went with this young man over to where his brother was lying in the gutter. He got out his, his handkerchief and kind of dusted him off and took care of the little scrapes, noticing that he was really going to be all right. He wasn't hurt and he got him back in the wheelchair. And he watched as his brother pushed him down the sidewalk back to their home. It was a very long, slow walk for him back to his car. And you know, the funny thing is he never bothered to repair that dent in the side door because for him, it was to remind him of the message, don't go through life 
so fast that someone has to throw a brick to get your attention. In the gospel reading today out of Mark 12, we discover that the Pharisees and the Sadducees are, are trying once again, aren't they, to, to trap Jesus? They, they knew he was stirring up the people. They wanted to get something of which they could, they could charge him with. And, and so they're, they're asking him about the commandments. But however, what they discovered was that here was a man who knew the law better than themselves. And more importantly, he knew the spirit of the law and not just the surface view. And some of them were actually very impressed. And one of the teachers heard them debating, and so he came up to Christ and, and he asked of all the commandments, which one, which one is the most important? You know, in the Jewish books of the law, in, in Genesis and in Exodus and Leviticus, in Numbers and Deuteronomy, Biblical scholars have counted 613 laws. And of these laws, 248 are considered to be positive in nature, while 365 are considered to be negative. In other words, some compel us to do certain things, and some of the laws forbid us to do other things. And these 613 laws are the basis of the Jewish belief. In his answer to the teacher of the law, Jesus boils all of the laws. He boils all of the commandments. He boils all of the teachings of the prophets down into one, one word. Love. Love God. Love your neighbor. And so sometimes doesn't it beg the question for us? Okay, we hear that word love. What, is it, what does it mean to love? I know this. One thing it means is that a person in need shouldn't have to throw a rock to get our attention. Christians are called to do more than just have nice, warm feelings towards somebody else. Followers of Christ are called to seek out people who are hurting and to minister to them. You know, wouldn't it be easy? It's, it's not that hard, really, if, <clears throat> if all our commandments were really simply about keeping the thou shalt nots. I remember my grandfather teaching me this little ditty when I was a young boy. We don't smoke and we don't chew and we don't go out with the girls that do. that's what it means to be a Christian, I think we can take care of that. It would be very hard, though, wouldn't it, to keep all of those 365 laws that ban us from doing something. It would be hard to do all of that. The most important thing that Christ told us was to love God and to love our neighbor. So sometimes it's got to get very personal. It's got to get down to, to you individually. You have to be able to answer this question of what is love? What is love to you? Is, is, is it just a nice emotion? Is, is it what you <clears throat> feel about dark chocolate? What is love? Let me tell you what it meant to one church up in Ohio and it's a story of a friend of mine who was a pastor, and they, were, they had just had this great building project, and they were redoing their worship space. And they had a basement there that they, they used um, as, as a homeless shelter for some men in the community at times, and, and, and that basement was pretty dreadful. But they really wanted to upgrade their worship service in came over there one day and I asked him, I asked, how's, how's it all going? He said, well, we've, we kind of ran out of money for our worship service. And I kind of thought, how do you do that? How do you do that? And he said, uh, he said, I know what you're thinking. 
They said, let me tell you the story about it. He said, you know, that basement was horrible. It had one really ratty little shower that none of us would ever go into. The, the, the walls, there, there was mold. There was, there, it was just horrible. And, and, and we just kept kind of renovating it. And we just kind of, kind of making it better. And, 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 and it was just lousy. And he said, on a Sunday before we reopened this shelter, this, this, this basement mission that the church did on the Sunday before we reopened it. It was a communion Sunday. And we had our worship service in the sanctuary. And, and when it came time for communion, we, we took the elements, we took the bread and we took the cup and, the, and all, of the, all of the congregation went downstairs into that basement. And we surrounded the empty beds there. And we passed around the bread and, and, and the cup and we said, the body of Christ that's given for you. He said, the next day, the, the beds were full and the worship service still needs a lot of work. What does that story say to you about love? It tells me that here's a congregation. It tells me that here's a church that doesn't need a rock thrown at them to get their attention. I'm saying that there are hurting people right now in our community, across the street, nearby in our communities, nearby in, 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 in HEB, in, in, in the pews with us today. Many are lonely. Some have emotional problems. Some, some are single parents that are overwhelmed by all the pressures and the to-dos that are in their life. Some of them are crushed by some form of addiction and, and, and we can be nice people and wait for them to come in our doors and when they come in, we can love on them and give them some Band-Aids. But I'm not sure that's the love that Christ is talking about. Love requires that somehow we find out who the hurting are and that we go to them. And that's kind of hard at times to find out really who are the hurting ones, isn't it? When I was a sophomore at A&M and my major was electrical, in, it was, my major was electrical engineering. My roommate that year was also an electrical engineer and we had some classes together and he was really smart. I mean, I kind of liked him being my roommate. And we had this lab and we had to build, in this lab we had to build a transmitter. And, and, and we were paired up and, and we were working it one afternoon in our dorm room and well, we were working it. That's kind of like we shot a bear and Papa pulled a trigger, but we, we, were, we were working on this transmitter and all of a sudden through the door comes the College Station Police and, 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 and the federal rescue team. We were scared to death. But it turned out that something in our transmitter was emitting a strong signal that a satellite had picked up that they had relayed that said there was someone in deep distress. Well, it was true when they came through the door. Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if everyone who needed help sent out this distress signal? so that we could identify who they are and we wouldn't know where to go? It simply means that we have to go out. And we have to go out and we have to go to the places in our community to find them. And there's so many different ways to do that. I read this story not too long ago. Uh, Tony Campalo uh, relayed this story of a of an individual who and he, the youth in his church every month, one Sunday and every month, would, would go to this nursing home and, and, and they would lead worship. And, and he decided he wanted to go with them just to be there. And so he, he went out and, and all he did was stand in the back of the room while they were leading worship. And, and one Sunday, this, this older man in a wheelchair, wheels up right next to him, and reaches up 
grabs his hand and holds his hand for the balance of the service. He did it the next month. The same thing the next month. And the next month and the next month. And then there came that one Sunday when he went there and, and the man didn't show. So he went out of the room, he asked the, the nurse that was in charge and she said, well, he's near death. He's actually down in room three and he's unconscious, but if, if you wish, you may go and, and, and visit him. So he walks down and he goes into the room and there was a chair, a bed, a man was lying in it. There were some IVs and on a stand. He could tell that he was, he was near death. And so on an impulse, he went over and he just took the old man's hand and he felt compelled to, to say a prayer. And at the end, he, he said, Amen. And that old man squeezed his hand. And it kind of shook him up and as he was leaving the room, he ran into the woman who was coming into the room and she said, he's been waiting for you. He said he did not want to die until Jesus came again and held his hand. I told him that when you die that you're going to get to meet Jesus and you're going to get to be him and you'll get to hold his hand. But he kept saying, he's saying no. Once a month, Jesus comes and holds my hand and I don't want to leave until I have a chance to hold the hand of Jesus once more. So my friends, where can you go to show the love of Christ to somebody? Where can you go to be the hands of Jesus for someone to hold? Wouldn't you agree with me that there's a lot of, of, of cynicism in our society toward organized religion that would disappear overnight if we just carried the love of Christ out these doors? What we need to see is every time we perform an act of love, we glorify Christ. The first commandment, of course, is to love God. But when we love somebody in Jesus' name, we are loving God. And when we love, it's not us doing the loving. We are simply the vehicles through which God loves. That haired young woman in the doctor's waiting room, maybe in the next pew, perhaps loving her means kind of looking after the toddler while she handles the baby. That person in the line at bank who doesn't understand English and is having trouble with, with deposits and withdrawals, maybe loving him means getting out of line and, and, and helping him. Maybe the next door neighbor who is struggling to keep the marriage together, the daughter who pushes our buttons, the, the husband who's scared of being laid off, these are the ones who so desperately need a strong, saving love they need to once again know that and feel that. They need to know the compassion. They need to know the mercy. They need to know the holiness and presence of Christ that is there with them. It is in these moments that we are called to dare to risk being rebuffed, being inconvenienced, even if it wrings our heart in some pain. It's what we were created. It's what we were redeemed. It's what we were commanded to do. Hang your whole life on love. For the truth is, it's God's love that's active in you. And my great, great friends, I promise you, God's love never fails. There's a song by Martina McBride. I suspect many of you are very familiar with it. If you're not, I would urge you to Google it and read the lyrics. It's about a wife who is facing disease. And her husband tells her that he will 
be there for her. It's called, I'm going to love you through it. The refrain is powerful and it's really about us as Christians and what we are to do for those in and outside this building. The last refrain goes like this. It says, and when the road gets too long, I'll be the rock that you lean on. Just take my hand. Together we can do it. I'm going to love you through it. We're called to be the rock that others lean on and not to have a rock thrown at us to get our attention. A teacher of the law did ask Christ of all the commandments, which is the greatest. And Christ told him to love your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And the man replied, you're right. Those commandments are much better than all of the burnt offerings and all of the sacrifices that we can make. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, <coughs> he said to him, you're not far. You're not far from the kingdom of God. That's where I want to live. Don't you? Near to the kingdom of God. And how do we do that? We just love. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, help us to be aware of those around us. Enable us to slow down. Keep us from going so fast that someone needs to throw a brick. <clears throat> 